Now, when there came a point when we were building the list of speakers, we had pretty much completed it. And it was funny how all the women who we had invited to speak had other commitments or reasons that they couldn't join us. And I was desperately looking to fill our final slot with a woman who would fit in and, and bring a beautiful gift. But then I came across the Anastasia book series. And I read the first one, and I was so impressed. It just, it really just expanded my mind. And what it offered, I thought, held so much that I was determined in some way to get a presentation that would be associated with the earth, with the ideas of spiritual permaculture. And I wanted to somehow incorporate the Anastasia series into this conference, but I didn't have any idea how that was going to turn out. And as those synchronicities would happen, I was doing an internet search late one night, and I came across Leonid Sharashkin's name. And I uh, learned as I did the research that he was working on his doctoral dissertation <laughs> on, on, <laughs> on the spiritual, cultural, and ec economic significance of the Russian permaculture gardening movement. And when I saw that, and that he was also the one who basically brought the Anastasia series, in, had it got it translated into English and brought it to the U.S. and to the English-speaking world, I got very excited and I was able to get in contact with him. And as it would turn out, he was available to come to us here in Hawaii to join us today for this presentation. So once again, it is my dear pleasure to announce Leonid Sharashkin. Good day, everybody. Thank you very much for being here today. And before we start, I think it, a small language of the a small lesson of the Russian language is in order. So, здравствуйте. In Russian, it means hello, but the actual meaning of the word, if you translate it literally, means may you rise with the sun or may your spirit uh, arise each day as the sun rises in the sky. Compare this with hello in English, which sounds almost like go to hell. <laughs> so spiritual permaculture, this is something that changed my life. And uh, when it did, I felt so much inspired to bring it to this country and to make this information available in the English language that I felt that if I didn't do this, I would uh, be blaming myself my whole life for having missed this opportunity. This is the piece of statistics that you ra rarely see reported in the media, not only uh, worldwide, but in Russia as well. When I look at it, you see that 51% of all agricultural products produced today in Russia come from people's gardens. It's more than all of the commercial agriculture taken together. Today, Russian gardeners produce $14 billion worth of food every year, which is almost 3% of Russia's GDP. Uh, their contribution uh, to the national economy not only exceeds that of corporate farming sector and independent farmers, it also exceeds uh, the contribution to GDP of steel industry, building materials industry, timber, forestry, pulp and paper industries, electric power generation uh, industry, chemical and pharmaceutical industries, or oil refining, natural gas, and coal mining industries taken together. Looking at this statistic, at this pie chart, with 51% of all food grown by people themselves, you would imagine that the whole of Russia's agriculture is just nothing but gardens. 
Yet look at this. This is the pie chart representing the area of land which is used for this production. And what you notice that this huge proportion of uh, the nations, and this is an industrially developed nations, agricultural output, 51% in 2004, is produced on just 7% of agricultural land. While industrial farming to produce its uh, uh, remaining 43% and 6% for independent farmers uh, require almost all of the land resources available in the country. And when you compare the two side by side, you start realizing that uh, the arguments that the proponents of, of commercial industrial agriculture are making are all false. They like saying that uh, large-scale industrial agriculture is more efficient because of the economies of scale. Yet the statistics that I've shown just uh, a second ago disprove this point. Then economists likes, like arguing that uh, commercial agriculture, where you have uh, uh, high pesticide use and high fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer use, is more productive. It can produce uh, a lot more than organic operations would produce. Yet the statistics that I will sh uh, share with you in a, in a minute disprove this as well. Then the proponents of industrial farming say, well, maybe industrial agriculture is not that good, is not that beautiful, but it is absolutely necessary and required to feed the world's starving population. And if we do not have industrial farming, half the world will starve to death. Well, but if it is more efficient, then why does this kind of farming and growing food supply require so much government subsidies? And uh, uh, why is it that, to, that today we cannot visualize a, a farming system or a food growing system that requires no subsidies, requires little or no machinery, therefore is not dependent on fossil fuels availability, requires no hired labor, and all the social problems associated with that. Doesn't have all these monstrous corporate structures that control uh, the seeds, the production of fertilizer, and the distribution of agricultural products. That is small scale and diverse, that is subsistence oriented, when people grow their own food rather than uh, exploiting the land to make a profit. That is predominantly organic and community building rather than community destroying and also has a vibrant cultural and spiritual dimension to it. It might look like an agricultural utopia, yet Russian example proves that this is a reality that can happen not only in Russia, but all over the world. So today, 35 million families, and this is 70% of Russia's population, cultivating 20 million acres of land, grow 53% of Russia's agricultural output. Actually, over the past years, this percentage increased to 54%, while the area employed uh, relatively, uh, relative to in industrial farming decreased from 7% to 3%. So on just 3% of agricultural land of the country, Russian gardeners grow uh, fifty four percent of russia 's uh, food produced in the country, and this is in a climate with only one hundred ten days of growing season. The last frost is mid May and the first frost is mid September in this short window from late May to early September is all you have in the year to produce the food for yourself and your family. When you look at particular products, not just at the aggregate of all output. The data are even more stunning, and this is official data published by the Russian Federal Statistics Agency. As you see, 22% of all potatoes grown from in the country come from uh, individuals' private plots, like backyard gardens, and only 8% from all of the commercial agriculture taken together. 77% of vegetables, 87% of berries and fruit. 60% of meat and 49% of milk. And this doesn't even include hunting, gathering, and fishing. This old woman, or as we say in Russian, babushka, is selling dried mushrooms she picked and dried herself 
by the walls of Kremlin, the residence of Russian president in downtown Moscow. Gardeners employ very simple yet very advanced and very thought through uh, growing methods, something that is impossible in industrial farming situations. Here you have potato crop growing between uh, small wind breaks of rye. And what it does, it is being grown in raised beds because of the wet summers. Uh, it's impossible in this particular region to cultivate uh, potatoes in uh, plain fields. You have to form raised beds, and this is something uh, that is uh, easy to do only in a small garden setting. It is very heavily mulched with straw, rice straw, as a weed control, and to add organic matter for the next year. And the crop is constantly rotated. Uh, the beds are switched every year, and the one year you, crop, you plant potatoes on this bed, particular bed in the middle, next year you will plant rye, and you will switch potatoes uh, on, the, on the other bed where rye was the previous year. And it is pest-free. There is no Colorado beetle because it was noticed that when you interplant potatoes with rye and use rye straw as mulch, there is no infestation with their, in this particular bug. And this is an example of their harvest produced in a year that was a complete failure for commercial agriculture for potatoes. Here's another example. This uh, small windbreak or hedgerow of raspberry bushes is a very nice example of uh, uh, Russian permaculture. Not only it protects the garden from uh, uh, winds, creates habitat for birds who nest in these uh, bushes and control pests naturally, it also keeps unwanted visitors out and produces an abundant uh, crop of raspberries. So you have it beautiful, productive, and also uh, performing multiple functions. In terms of productivity, the statistics that I've shown, how does it translate to uh, the output generated by each family? Well, on average, every gardening family in the nation produces per year more than 2,000 pounds of potatoes, 7, 000, 700 pounds of vegetables, 200 pounds of fruit, and uh, more than 500 quarts of milk. You would imagine that if it is so productive on such a small area of land, that means that uh, Russian Dutchniks, this is how Russian gardeners are called, were allotted the most productive lands in the country, but it is far from being the case. During the Soviet period, the only land that was made available to uh, gardeners for cultivation was marginal land that couldn't be used in commercial agriculture. This typical Dutch settlement is situated along a power line cutting through the forest. So we cannot speak about the most productive and uh, uh, fertile lands in the country. The plots themselves are very, very small. It's less than the size of this room we are sitting in. And there, on this picture taken probably 20 years ago, and you can see my parents' plot with young uh, fruit trees and the potato patch and the simple shelter to spend the night on the weekend and uh, to store gardening tools. This is the same plot uh, two years ago. A nice addition was this bath house or banya. And uh, again, the same vegetable beds in early spring. The trees have grown and unproduced an abundant harvest of apples and other fruit. Uh, it is also more than growing potatoes. This creates a totally new connection within the family. When you visit your parents in this country, what new can your parents show to you? The new furniture? the new house, new kitchen cabinets. Well, in Russia, most parents can, call, uh, can show their children and grandchildren the trees that these children planted 20 years ago. And uh, this brings families together after decades. 
notice my mom's pigtails that my daughter made for her. And uh, Dacha is the space that creates the space for a very informal communication, something you would imagine in an urban setting. The same plot uh, in summertime with plantings of vegetables, or strawberries, peas. This is another kind of uh, settlement, and you will notice the houses are very close together because the individual plots are so small. This is an upscale Dutch settlement. Some houses are built of brick, and even though here you can see the lawns and ornamentals, most uh, of the plots do have a greenhouse or cold frame, and their, their owners continue to cultivate their own food. Not very different in, in rural areas. This is a, a village. The plots are a little bit larger because there is more land available in the rural areas. And you can see the potato patch and the cold frames in this picture as well. Everything is done by hand. Here, Colorado beetle uh, is being picked by hand. But actually, it can be not as uh, labor intensive. It's enough to invite neighborhood kids to pick Colorado beetle and pay them one cent per beetle. In two days, and just after expending a couple of bucks, you will have no more beetles on, on your potato patch. This is what many people are doing. It also creates uh, vibrant small enterprises throughout the country. Uh, and people don't even have to go to the market to sell their produce. Everybody knows that it was produced organically, so people are willing to come and pick up their vegetables or, uh, in this case, their milk right to the owner's house. It doesn't require transportation or tracking the produce around the country or internationally around the globe. All that many gardeners employ is a bicycle to get to and from their plot. The only labor employed is the labor of the family. There are no hired workers who cross the border to earn miserable wages and uh, create social problems and social unrest. Gardeners do work a lot, 18 hours per week during the uh, growing season over the weekend that makes almost the whole day over the weekend spent in cultivation. And most of them also have to travel to their garden plot from the city because people do not have backyards, they live in larger uh, urban conglomerates in apartment blocks. Some economists, when they looked at the Dacia movement in Russia, said that it was not economic, because it was not producing for the market, but for subsistence, and they calculated that people on the average spend $1,000 worth of their labor digging the dirt, producing only $140 worth of uh, vegetables and fruit. And one of the reports made for the World Bank and their uh, International Committee on, on Development sponsored by the British government concluded that Dutch makes no economic sense. But the question to you, if 35 million families do this and uh, are happy with that and produce 54% of the total agricultural output in the country, then what doesn't make sense? The practice practiced by everybody or the conclusions of the economists? And it is not just about growing food. In this picture, you can see the Nobel Pr Prize winner, uh, Boris Pasternak, author of Dr. Zhivago, uh, digging potato patch on his dacha in Peridelkina. This is where he wrote Dr. Zhivaga, and he was spending his hours digging his potato patch just to, as a way to reconnect to nature and the, the way he put himself as a spiritual survival path. Both poor do this and the rich do this. When you compare all the pictures that I've shown to you uh, in the previous slides with this one, it looks like a desert. Not only it is uh, not as beautiful as the gardens, it is environmentally destructive because of the pesticide use. 
you would imagine that the Russian government, with all this powerful gardening movement, would get very excited about supporting gardeners and would put in play, into place policies to encourage gardening? No way. This is a quote from Russian Federation Food Security Act. The national food security is defined as the ability of the nation's industrial agriculture to satisfy food requirements of the population. That means that if all the people in the country feed themselves, but if the industrial agriculture subsidized by the government is not uh, functioning well, then there is no food security in the nation. But this practice of having a garden and growing your own food was so wide, widespread and that uh, its significant, significance went unnoticed until recently, when in 1996, a Russian author, Vladimir Megre, started putting out a series of books that he called the Ringing Cedars series. He was a Siberian businessman who chartered a, a motorboat to make trade trips along the Siberian River Ob to the very far north and back to the south. He was trading with local people and was basically concerned about uh, earning as much money as he could. On one of the trips, he heard local elders telling about uh, strange sacred trees that they refer to as ringing cedars, trees that emit audible vibrations after 500 years of their life. He was very intrigued with the commercial potential of uh, Siberian cedars, did some background research and realized that uh, a lot of money could be made on uh, using these trees for uh, business purposes. So he, in 1995, he set up another expedition and traveled there again. He wanted to find these ringing cedar trees and learn more about extracting cedar nut oil. But his uh, encounter with the elder's granddaughter, Anastasia, transformed him so deeply that he abandoned his commercial plans, let his company uh, go bankrupt, and started writing down the insights that she has shared with him during uh, their three days together in the taiga. What's more remarkable is that even before the book was written, even before it was published in the original Russian, she already promised him that if he wrote about his experiences with her, then he would become rich and famous. He laughed at that. He was very skeptical because he was a businessman, not a writer. And actually, when he wrote Anastasia, his first book, the manuscript was rejected by all the publishers he submitted it to. This left him with no other choice but to self-publish. And in 1996, he made a small print run of 2,000 copies of uh, Anastasia. And true to her promise, three years later, he was Russia's one of the best read authors, and to date his book sold 10 million copies in 20 languages, and started a powerful Back to the Earth and Eka Village movement, not only in Russia, but in other countries as well. The book was so successful that he was encouraged to write the sequences and to travel back to Siberia for more insights. And now there are nine volumes in the series. He is still writing. The book started being translated into Eastern European languages. Then into German, French, Italian. There are some translations that are so new that I don't have cover uh, pictures. But until recently, these books were not available in the English language. Now they are. Uh, this is what mass media are writing in uh, uh, Russia and in former USSR republics. Over the last few years, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine experienced a real eco-village boom. Thousands of families are building their kin's domains. 
Spiritual and religious leaders throughout the country supported these books. Uh, the leader of Russian Muslims, Talgat Tajruddin, in a public interview declared that he loves these books and derives a lot from these books for himself. Prominent politician, for example, this member of Russian parliament, uh, Medikov, not only openly, openly supported uh, the books and the ideas and the nascent eco-village movement, but even went as far as authoring books about it. Medikov wrote a book which is called Putin, the name of Russia's president, Migre, the author of the books, and Russia's future. He stated that there, this was the birth of Russia's new national idea that will transform not only the whole country, but the whole world. Indeed, in a few years that elapsed since the first book was published, there was a very powerful social movement born. This is a picture of a gathering of uh, representatives of 150 eco villages from all over Russia that gathered in the city of Vladimir in June 2004 for a conference of the Ringing Cedars movement. Also, just as Anastasia predicted in the very first book before it was published, the book produced a very powerful creative response in the readers. And thousands of people started writing poetry, making paintings. This is a very, simple, a very small sample of readers' art that was sent to Anastasia Foundation by the readers of the series. And even more importantly, this creative upsurge was uh, manifested in new permaculture gardens that sprouted all over the country. Here is an example of a mixed permaculture planting in central Russia. People get together, they buy abandoned agricultural field like this one in the background, they plant trees and establish their family domains. Others go to abandoned villages and bring back life to villages that had been dying. All over Russia, new homes are being built by people inspired by these books. This is our eco village, Radnoy, in central Russia, 100 miles east of Moscow. This is a very typical situation of the new settlers open field, a small log cabin, but the life already goes on in this. Sir. Uh, small cabin while their uh, garden is growing. This leaves a lot of time not only for planting your garden but for social interaction with your neighbors, having fun together in the summer. And the ideas appeal not only to the younger generation but to people of all ages. These eco-villages are very different from what is known by the word of communities or intentional communities in this country. Because uh, it is not a commune. It is rather a neighborhood in which every family owns their small plot of land, at least uh, two and a half acres in size. The question that Vladimir Megre asked is in his books, if uh, working part-time just on weekends, on very small marginal pieces of land, people can produce 54% of the agricultural output on the country, then what would happen if people were allowed to take larger pieces of land, to plant the garden there, and work there full-time? Not only he argued would this create a very powerful economic, new economic system, but it would also serve as a vehicle for spiritual transformation. And this is what he referred to as kin's domain, or family domain, to denote that it should be passed from one generation to the next in the same family. So this is what is happening all over Russia. Old fields like this one are being bought 
and they're subdivided with the small squares representing these uh, king's domains of the future. He said that the setting that you create for yourself and your children with, will not only feed your body, but also your spirit, because uh, it will be changing with the seasons. The picture that you, living picture that you create on the canvas of, of your domain will never be the same. He also emphasized that the most important thing is the thought and the consciousness that you put into this design. Because what you create will be the manifestation of your level of conscious awareness. One person will create a lifeless parking lot and another will create a paradise garden. What is important there is not the physical uh, manifestation, but the conscious awareness that uh, stands behind it. When, after looking at all these new designs and new eco-villages and the existing dachers throughout the country, I go back to looking at the typical agricultural landscape, I start realizing why agriculture as we know it today has almost become a curse, where man has to work by the sweat of his brow to earn his bread while ruining nature and raping nature at the same time. But is it all possible? Is this transformation possible? Is it possible for humans to create an environment that would be supporting both their bodies and their spirits? He was very concerned with finding an answer to this question and finding real life proofs. And he did. In book five, which is called Who Are We? He describes what he calls the garden for eternity. In the middle of the agricultural fields, there is an old orchard more than 100 years old that is surrounded by the windbreak of uh, sacred trees of Siberian cedar, oak, and maple. This orchard has been maintenance-free and fertilization-free for almost 100 years now. The trees were never trimmed, never pruned, never replaced, never fertilized. This proved to the author, and on book five of, uh, in the translation, we reproduce some of these uh, photos on the inside covers, that you can create a garden that would be so close to the natural cycle that it would ultimately produce the crops every year without uh, any input of labor. This is what he observed back there in Taiga, where Siberian cedars produce bumper crops of uh, uh, cedar nuts, we call them Siberian pine nuts, uh, without any fertilization. Well, you look at all these abandons, again, the agriculture of today looks completely insane. Look at it, all species that live on the earth are adapted to their environment, and their, their environment provides for all their needs. And then this man looks like a complete outcast that is incapable of feeding himself without ruining the planet he lives on. What Migre and his inspiration, Anastasia, argue in these books is that the gates of paradise are open. They have always been open. There is no guarding standing by them preventing our return to the paradisical garden. Actually, the word garden and guardian come from the same root. It is the human mind, this human consciousness, that prevents us from creating gardens similar to this one and manifesting it in our reality. 
How relevant is this to the United States? Here is a very beautiful community garden in downtown Minneapolis. This particular site was bare dirt, bulldozed dirt, three years before this picture was taken. In just a space of three years, community gardeners created a space of beauty and their very productive garden means this urban landscape, the same garden. Of course, there are well-known communities like Findhorn, where people consciously communicate with plants and have a great success in communing with nature while producing very abundant and beautiful crops. But the question is, why is it not happening on a larger scale, like in Russia? Actually, when you look at the gardens in this country, many people do have gardens in their backyards, but the focus is ornamental. Flowers, ornamental bushes and trees. And it's interesting, like different cultures value different things. The American culture is the culture of appearances, external appearances. Therefore, it values flowers over fruit. It, it uh, values youth over maturity and old age. And it also values the external appearances over the inner substance and inner essence. So I think that this example of all these possibilities being open to everybody and not, being happening on the, not happening on the larger scale in this country is a clear example of how our consciousness affects our planet. It's also important to say that America has much, much better climate for gardening than Russia has. Longer growing season, and if you translate these 18 hours per week that mm, Russian adults spend gardening during the growing season for the whole year, that means less than six hours per week. For the Americans, it would be even less than uh, uh, an hour, uh, six hours per week because the climate is so good, you don't have to worry about many things you have to take care of back in Russia. There is no free land in this country for gardening. In Russia, on 20 million acres, gardeners produce 50% of agricultural output. In the USA, there are 47 million acres of law, law which produces a 25 billion lawn care industry only. <laughs> Again, the differences are not in climate, in wealth of the country but in the level of uh, consciousness and uh, in, the, in the mentality. Just because, before coming to this conference, I got a postcard in the mailbox of the place I'm staying uh, at on Maui. This is about eradicating hunger in this country. Two simple stamps to get rid of hungry people. Well, not hungry people, but of hunger. Put some non-perishable food items in the bag and place it in your mailbox. Your letter carrier will pick up and deliver it to local food banks. My five-year-old daughter looked at this picture and asked me to translate what it was about. I said, well, they don't want people to go hungry. She said, wow, it's a great idea, isn't it? I said, yes. She said, and what do they suggest? I said, well, uh, they suggest buying some canned food in the supermarket and giving it to the poor. She paused for about two minutes and then said, but in the first place, why are there hungry people? And she said, don't they know that you can take a seed, plant it into the ground, and it will grow food for you? And today I was talking to her over the phone, and she was asking how I was doing here. I was saying, well, I'm trying to tell people about how good Anastasia is and about how good it is to plant your own garden, and people are listening. She says, well, I have a message for them. I, say, I said, go ahead. And she said, people, do not put canned food in your mailboxes for the hungry people. <laughs> because if you do, they will eat it and they will still be hungry 
but the next time you will have to put medicines and drugs into a mailbox to cure them of the diseases they got from eat, eating canned food. <laughs> Fortunately, not everybody is under the spell of this psychological conditioning and suggestion that suggests that all the food is coming from a supermarket shelf. I translated into Russian Schumacher's uh, work, Small is Beautiful, which I love. And he was saying that in the simple question of how we treat the land, not next to people, our most precious resource, our entire way of life is involved. And before our policies with regard to the land will really be changed, there will have to be a great deal of philosophical, not to say religious, change. He was also saying that the true function of agriculture is, first, to connect humankind to the earth. Second, to make a piece of land that you work on beautiful. And he was saying that productivity, the only goal of agriculture accepted today, will be as a byproduct of a healthy, beautiful, and nonviolent communication with the earth. And when you look at the Russian example, you can see the proof of Schumacher's words. In Russian, the word dachnik, gardener, means literally the one who gives. Compare this to the attitude of conventional agriculture that is all about taking as much as possible from the land. These ideas about the spiritual connection to the, uh, not only to the plant world, but to the source through gardening are not new. Look at this world, word. Can you see a four letter word on the screen? Exactly, cult. And what is cult? Anybody has a dictionary? If you open the dictionary and look at it, it comes from the Latin to take care of the soil. And this is because our ancestors made no distinction between caring for the soil and communicating with God. For them it was the same thing. In Russian, and modern Russian, and still very, very close to Sanskrit, in Russian the word God means a year, a yearly cycle, meaning that the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth of nature is the divinity here on earth. The word nature in Russian means attached to God. And the word family literally means a seed. Moreover, in Russian tradition, there are legends that describe that attraction to the earth, the physical attraction to the earth, gravity, and attraction to the earth, affection for the earth, love for the earth, is the same, one and the same thing. And it is, and the only reason why we do not fall into the space while there is the uh, pool of gravity of the earth that holds our bodies here, is because of our feeling of love and reverence for the planet we live on. Then the question arises, how do we get from where we are today to this marvelous future where the land will be fertile and beautiful and people will, will play in beautiful gardens full of fruit and not on our parking lots. One of the ways in which this series of books is so unique is that it offers very practical advice and I will read you one page from our, the first volume of the series, Anastasia. Anastasia stated, every seed you plant contains within itself an enormous amount of information about the universe. Nothing made by human hands can compare with this information either in size or accuracy. 
Through the help of this data, the seed knows the exact time when it is to come alive, grow, what juices it is to take from the earth, how to make use of the rays of the celestial bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, what it is to grow into, what fruit to bring forth. The fruits are designed to sustain man's life. More powerfully and effectively than any manufactured drugs of the present or future, these fruits are capable of counteracting and withstanding any disease of the human body. But to this end, the seed must know about the human condition so that during the maturation process, it can satiate its fruit with the right correlation of substances to heal a specific individual of his disease if indeed he has one or is prone to it. In order for the seed of a cucumber, tomato, or any other plant grown in one's plot to have such information, the following steps are necessary. Before planting, put into your mouth one of these little seeds, hold them in your mouth under the tongue for at least nine minutes. Then place the seed between the palms of your hands and hold it there for about 30 seconds. During this time, it is important that you be standing barefoot on the spot of earth where you will later be planting it. Open your hands and carefully raise the seed which you are holding to your mouth. Then blow on it lightly, warming it with your breath, and the wee little seed will know everything that is within you. Then you need to hold it with your hands open another 30 seconds, presenting the seed to the celestial bodies and the seed will determine the moment of its awakening. The planets will be helping it and will give the sprouts the light they need to produce fruits especially for you. According to Anastasia, the seed is thus able to take in information about the person who plants it and then during the cultivation of its fruit, it will pick up from the universe and the earth the optimum blend of energies and substances needed for a given man. During the cultivation time, it is vital to communicate with the plant, at least once during its growth period. And it is desirable to approach and touch it during a full moon. And a station maintains that the fruit cultivated from the seed in this manner and consumed by the individual who cultivated it is capable not only of curing him of any diseases of the flesh whatsoever, but also of significantly retarding the aging process, rescuing him from harmful habits, tremendously increasing his mental abilities and giving him a sense of inner peace. Wow, when I read this, it was a revolution. The publisher of the books, who manages now the publishing, when he read this verse, he quit his job. And he moved from Australia to Maui to be supervising the distribution of the books in the English language. So what is this idea about imbuing the seed that you plant with information about you, the person who is growing it? Is it new or not new? Well, we know that plants do influence human body and spirit very powerfully. There is an example of homeopathy. Very small amounts, even just the vibrations diluted in water uh, of plant material can influence human body. We also know that human mind and human emotion can influence plant growth. In uh, the spiritual system we are most familiar with, Christianity, this is what is said in one of the Gospels. He said to the fig tree, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. What is this is not a demonstration of the power of human consciousness, human thought over the plant world. It also says in the Bible, and the life was the light of man. This is consistent with the Russian tradition as well. Here is this da Vinci, da Vinci man. In the middle, this is an ancient traditional wood carving. 
and I do wood carvings, and I made the, an exact replica of this carving, which you see on the screen. On the screen. In Russian tradition, the man represented by the cross in the middle is surrounded by vibrations and the, the rays of energy and light. And interestingly, on ancient Russian wood carvings, light was always coming from man, not from the sun. And consistent with what she says in, the, in Anastasia, sun is but a reflection of the energy and the light of human love coming from human hearts. And this is a cookie mold used for baking traditional Russian cookie bread. This one is this big. And it was believed that it preserves the vibrations of the uh, carving. And when you consume it, then the physical bread also nourishes your spiritual body. So we know that plants influence humans, and we know that humans can influence plants in a very direct way, not only physically, but mentally and through their emotions. So what if we connect it together? Look at that. Has anybody for the last hundreds of thousands of years thought to connect this concept of homeopathy, understanding that plants in very small doses influence human body and spirit, and apply the same concept in a, creating a loop. In fact, there, was quite, there were quite a few fertility rites when you can glimpse that this understanding was available to our forebears, our ancestors. In many cultures up to the present day, there is the rite by which the placenta of a newly born baby is buried under a fruit tree. And it is believed that this fruit tree will be producing fruit especially for this child. Also, you know from biblical texts that there is a custom still practiced in the Middle East today when you receive a guest, the first thing you do is wash his feet. Not everybody might know what is done next with this water the feet were washed in. This water is poured under the grape wine, the grape wine from which the fruit for this guest will later be taken, picked. In uh, ancient Greece, there was the fertility rite when a young couple would uh, have sexual intercourse on a freshly sown field to promote its fertility. These examples can be continued. So what these series of books to me did, they brought this knowledge, part of which was forgotten, and part of which was not making sense uh, anymore in the present time, back to life in a language understandable to everybody and is leading people on a transformation. I did have a personal transformation after reading these books. My first degree is in business and international economics and I was preparing myself for a career in oil business. <laughs> after reading these books, not only I changed my uh, career path and now I'm completing a degree in forestry, I also bought a small acreage in a rural area in this eco village east of Moscow and uh, built a log cabin on it. And I'm not alone. There are thousands of families around me that are doing the same. In one of his readings, uh, Edgar Casey was saying that uh, from Russia will come greater hope for the world and a new spiritual revolution. I thank you all for your attention and for allowing me to share this hope with you today. We still have some time, 
and I'm under a contractual obligation to deliver a 90-minute talk <laughs> to earn my honorarium, so we still have about 20 minutes to go. And I would gladly take questions if you have any. in Russian, all six. Can she get it from Maui? Uh, not the Russian version. Actually, uh, the Russian version of the books is available online at Anastasia.ru website. This is the official website of Anastasia Foundation, the nonprofit that was founded by Vladimir Megre to provide support to Russia's nascent eco-village movement. So it's possible to order them. There are a number of online uh, stores that sell Russian books. I think they are even available from Amazon.com. But basically, it's also possible to download full text of all the books written in Russian from Anastasia.ru. OK, she was looking for those books. I read them all six. And through the first three, I read, I, f I fell asleep, I read, I fell asleep, I read, and I fell asleep. It went very, very deep, and I am a fan, and I'm in contact with her, actually, on the inner planes. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple questions. Um, number one, have you ever met Anastasia? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, she made a very clever, conscious choice not to be readily available to visitors. And she has chosen to deliver her messages through Vladimir Megre alone. And she has done that, and this is described in one of the books, consciously to avoid making herself in a new icon that people will worship. She doesn't want to be perceived as a guru, a teacher. She always says, I'm just a human being like everybody. Everybody has these abilities, this knowledge. The only thing, you have to remember it within yourself and start putting it into practice. And also, you know, some people seriously ask the question whether this is fiction or non-fiction, whether this woman actually exists or whether uh, it is an invention by the author. I, I was never, to tell you the truth, I was never asked this question on this conference, but uh, elsewhere people do ask this question. I personally know the author, and he doesn't give an impression of a man who can, uh, for the sake of making money, sit down and write a book that would captivate hearts of millions of people worldwide. If he managed to produce this and invent this all, congratulations to him and congratulations to all of us for having this. But again, he is not a spiritual leader. He doesn't have any spiritual or religious background to speak about. So he doesn't give an impression of somebody who couldn't invent the whole thing. And you said you had two questions? Well, the other question is I noticed on the front, you know, the pictures on the front of the book, of course, are drawn. And then on the Russian version, there was a picture of a woman. Mm -hmm. So is this just somebody's imagination or? The pictures of the English edition are works of a Russian artist, not exactly an artist. He's an entomologist. He's studying butterflies. When he read the books, he was so inspired that he started painting during the nights, and he produced the series of paintings that we used for the covers. On the Russian edition, according to the author Vladimir Megre, he was saying that it is the picture of Anastasia, which is on book one of our, uh, the Russian version of the series. And he said that it was uh, reworked and digitally modified in Photoshop, um, Makeup was applied to make it more appealing to the mainstream reader at the insistence of the publisher and other things. But he was saying that this is, the way he was saying, this is her image. Understand it the way you can. So he's not saying it is her photo. He's saying the woman on the cover is her image. Yes? I have a, I have a comment and a question. First of all, I want to thank you so much for translating uh, Anastasia and the whole series in English. It's been such an incredible journey for me. And I want to thank uh, Angelica 
uh, when I asked her, what kind of books can I read before I come to the conference? And she says, you've got to read an, uh, Anastasia. Well, when I first read the first book, well, I had to get them all, the six series that's available, and I'm anxious for the next one. So that's, that's how I feel about the, those books. It's just a profound, profound spiritual journey in many, many dimensions. And the question I have, uh, may you, can you please describe her relationship with the animals in a taiga? It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, basically, I didn't want to go into much detail about the actual content of the book in my presentation because I think that uh, if you are interested, you will be able to read it uh, yourselves. But briefly, she relates to the animals living close to her habitat the way we relate to pets. Uh, more than that, uh, in our society, it is us humans who are taking care of the pets. Uh, in uh, her environment, it is the natural world and the wilder animals living uh, close to her glade that take care of her needs. Uh, squirrels are collecting nuts and uh, mushrooms and bring it to her for food, so she doesn't have to be concerned about uh, providing for the needs of her body in any way because it is being taken care of by the natural environment she lives in. Some people seriously thought that once they read the book, got inspired, moved to the Echo Village, that then the next day uh, the squirrels will bring them nuts and their <laughs> bears will bring them tubers. And it is not happening. Some people are frustrated about that. <laughs> I'm really thrilled about the book, Leo. And um, in translating from Russian to English and editing it, is there something in the Russian that was left out of the English translation, and, and why? Uh, thank you for the question. It is very, very difficult to translate things from Russian into English. I can tell you a little bit about how these books were published in uh, English. Uh, when I read them, I realized that if I didn't uh, make these books available in the English language, then uh, I would be blaming myself my whole life for having missed this opportunity, because I felt that if this, these books so powerfully influenced me and transformed my life and the life of my family, very positively transformed. I wanted many people in this country to have access to this information because I cannot think of any other books that would contain these messages. So I wanted to make this book available in the, lang in the English language. And I approached the author in 2003 with a request to allow me to start the publication project and translate the books. And there was silence. He was not saying yes, he was not saying no, he was just not responding, even though I was meeting him personally. And later I realized why the reason was, because I originally thought to approach large publishers, HarperCollins or Penguin or Random uh, House, whatever, and offer them to translate and publish these books. But then when I came to the United States for my uh, doctoral program in forestry, I went to the Borders store and I bought uh, some of the works of Russian classics, Leo Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and back home I started comparing them to the Russian original. And what I saw that they were professionally translated, all the words were translated correctly, but the imagery, the feelings behind the words were completely lost. I realized why, why this, this was the silence from the author, because as long as I had this vision of just approaching a large publisher and persuading them to publish these books, there was no response from them. Once I realized that, within two weeks he called me and said he is giving me green light to proceed my project. And we went ahead and we found the best translator we could find who would be able to translate images and feelings behind the words. He has 40 years experience of translating Russian poetry. And because Russian is a much, uh, much more descriptive language, thank you, uh, you can change small part of the word and it will already have a color to it. You can, instead of the T 
tree, you change a little uh, something in the world that it is already a nice tree, or beautiful tree, or small tree. So because of this, it is very difficult to convey uh, the meaning in the English language, the imagery in the English language. But the way I edit the books, I take the chapters translated, and I take the Russian original. I read sentence by sentence the Russian original, and I'm listening to the sensations I get uh, in my body. Physically, when I read these books, I have a chicken skin and uh, the feeling of cold wave running up and down my spine all the time. And uh, so I read the Russian original, and then I read the translation. And if I do not have uh, the same sensation from the translation, I feel that uh, it is not perfect, and we rework until I have the same sensations. So this is my editorship role. Thank you. Maybe the last question, because uh, we only have a couple minutes left. I have a comment and two questions. The first one is, how is the name pronounced? Anastasia? In, in Anastasia. Russian, it is pronounced with the stress on E. Anastasia. Anastasia. That's what I read in the book, and that's how I've been pronouncing it. Anastasia, we consciously decided to use the more familiar term so as not to distract uh, readers by unfamiliar spelling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as far as he's concerned, it doesn't really matter how people are pronouncing it as long as they're pronouncing it. Oh, it doesn't it. even matter for him whether people mm -hmm. think it is an invention or a real life story. Yes. It says on the very first book, he even insisted on publishers throughout the world putting it on the title page, a quote from her, I exist for those for whom I exist. And this is the end of the question. Mm -hmm. Because he, she herself was saying, and he always said, if the question is being asked, then if for this particular person she doesn't exist, then it just means that uh, this particular individual is not bad or good, spiritual or unspiritual, just uh, he cannot relate to this particular information. So for him, she, she doesn't exist. But we have hundreds and thousands of account of people who can communicate with Anastasia mentally. We are putting some of these uh, uh, reviews and testimonials on our website, ringingseeders.com. What was your question? Yes. Um, next year, of course, there's an election in Russia. And you mentioned a book, Putin and Megre. And as I understand it, in the Russian electoral process, whoever Putin anoints or uh, uh, recommends mm -hmm. uh, is pretty much going to get there. Are there any major or minor politicians who have embraced this? And then the second part is more a comment that in the United States at the present time, the economic structure of the real estate market is such that would make it more difficult for people to embrace the concept of subdividing land into this type of thing. But that's changing, too. That's just a comment. And maybe you have a comment about how that works in Russia. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, thank you for your question. It's an excellent question, actually. Maybe if I present uh, at this conference next year, I will have exciting news for you. But what is interesting, Adam, in book five that was published in Russian in, two th in, in the year 2000, in book five in the year 2000, she says, in a few years, there will be a Russian president who will publicly endorse the idea of king's domains. Guess what? Putin is saying that his uh, successor should be a certain Medvedev, who is now the vice prime minister, is, and he is believed to be Russia's next president. Two months ago, giving an interview, he was asked the question about King's domains. And he said he is totally supporting the idea. Wow. Whether it will actually change much or not, it's hard to say. Right now, it's very difficult for the first settlers to obtain the land title. Some of them have to wait five years until their paperwork for the land title is ready. And uh, in our Echo Village, the cost of the land itself was less than $30 per acre. 
but after you go all through the bureaucracy and pay all the bribes, the, the, cost, the cost goes from $30 per acre to $400. But the difference, 370 it is just the costs of getting the paperwork done. So, but you know, in Russia, this is the country where what the government or the church is doing is not really affecting tremendously the life of people. Uh, the Christian church, and I'm not talking about the teaching of Christ, I'm teaching about the establishment of the church, spent 1,000 years eradicating paganism and pagan ideas of reconnecting to God through nature and not through the establishment in uh, intermediaryship of the church. Guess what? Today they are very, very concerned that uh, the Ringing Cedars books are manifesting the renaissance and rebirth of the ideas they thought they were done with 1,000 years ago. And uh, the Russian Orthodox Church declared that uh, Ringing Cedars books were written by a Satan. And incarnate, of course. And that members Whoever wrote the book, uh, whoever read the books, becomes a member of satanic cult that perverts human spirit. Don't get too concerned because the Russian Orthodox Church also included in the list of satanic cults in Russia, Herbalife Company. Any multi-level marketing company is said to be perverting human spirit. And there is a list of 400 organizations or books, etc. Russian Orthodox Church is considering the works of Satan, and the Ringy Cedars series are in the list. So you have a rare experience of reading something that was written firsthand by the devil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, probably I will be able to answer more questions uh, at the table, and I thank you again for your attention, for your questions, and for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.